Well, good afternoon. It being 4 p.m., I will call the Committee on City Services of the City Council to order uh, at a December 3rd meeting on Monday. And um, I'll just note for the record that presents are uh, Councillor Dennis Bickle, Councillor Jim Nash, Councillor Miriam Barge, and myself, Councillor Maureen Carney. <coughs> and um, Pam, I hope you'll bear with us. What we need to do is, because Councillor LaBarge has a meeting she has to get to, we'll take care of one quick item, and then we'll let you no take the ball, and then we'll take the rest of our stuff up after. So I'm going to actually ask if um, we can just dispense with the regular order and jump right to the uh, appointment of Randy Krotowski that Marianne has reviewed. Thank you. Um, I had a lovely talk with um, Randy Krotowski, a long talk, and I kind of like wrote things down. Him and his wife spent 30 years moving 14 times all over North America for career reasons. And four years ago, they started looking for some place that reflected their interests and values where they could put down roots. They decided Northampton was that place. Given his background as an engineer with construction and environmental remediation experience in the first 15 years of his career, and a lifelong passion for on ecology and natural history, he felt the Conservation Commission and the Planning Board were the highest and best use of his abilities. Outside of his work, most of his volunteering over the last decade has been with wildlife preservation, rehabilitation, and community education. His personal interests include bird watching, hiking, creating a wildlife friendly landscape. So he's very familiar with both sides of development, protection, as well as dealing with the consequences of poor, usually uniform, ununiform development. <coughs> um, he has very, very values, very prospective values. He believes in long-term sustainable development. He also believes that we need to find a way for development to occur in an environmentally responsible manner. He also has a personal value of fairness, justice, might be because of his Canadian roots. So I'm more of a pragmatist than an idealist. I believe that there will be continued development until population growth slows. So it's critical that it be done in a way that ideally generates a positive environmental and ecological impact over the long term. And hopefully he is looking for us counselors to prove him to be on the Conservation Commission. I'd like to make a positive recommendation. Okay, a motion for a positive recommendation for Randy Krotowski to the Conservation Commission. Any second? Second. Okay. Um, any other discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, none. Abstentions. So that motion carries. And thank you. I thank you for your patience. We'll go right on to Pam's presentation. If that, you can join us right at the table. Thank Let's you. Please. Come on up. Hello, it's Hello, everybody. Doing today? Great. Hi. How are you? <laughs> together a presentation for you based on the notes that Laura sent me about what you'd like to talk about concerning elections. <coughs> and I'd like to start from the back, this big long sheet, because this is really the picture of how many people came to vote on election day and for early voting and for um, absentee voting. And so this basically is a snapshot that says that 72% of the registered voters came to the polls or came to early voting or requested an absentee ballot. And I broke it down for you on this summary sheet based on the ward 
if you look at, for example, 2A, I think, was our highest voter turnout at 81% of the registered voters All coming right. to the All right. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, so if you look at the early voters, we had 2,557 voters who came during a two-week or 10-day period plus a Saturday, so 11 days total, um, as opposed to going to the polls or requesting an absentee ballot. It was great. It was busy. We were energized. We had staff here to help us and we had the, the Registrar Voters Office revamped to have uh, pulling boots and we had the staff to check in, check out people, and, as well as councils. It was a lot of fun. It was great, I have to say, because I, um, I don't, I think it's only, since we started early voting, I went in and there's no wait and people were right. really friendly and it was just, uh, you know, yeah. nice way to get it done. Yeah, it, uh, yeah it, it was a lot of people. I don't, there, it, it was about half of the people they had for the presidential election, which was uh, two years prior to that. Uh, and I do anticipate that we probably will see more like 5,000 people come in for, to early vote for the presidential election in two years, yeah. at least. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What did you say was the highest voting what ward? Uh, in 2A, they had 81% of the registered voters come out to vote. Yep, cast a, cast a ballot. Yeah, 1A is, and, yep. And I see 6A was 71% and 6B was 76%. Yep. Yep. And Pam, do you think in two years for the presidential, the current arrangement of using the registrar's office will work again for double the number of people? Absolutely. Okay. We we uh, the the voting booths worked um, to capacity every day. We had about 250 people come in to vote for nine days. On the last day, we had 500 people come in. And on that 500 day, we, they were the booths were constantly busy. Mm -hmm. I anticipate that that's probably what it will be like. Which day was the 500? The, the last day. Yeah, day before. Yeah. That yeah. month. Uh, no, Friday. Friday. The Friday. Yeah, it was so. November 2nd. November uh, 2nd. Was that the Friday or Saturday? The Friday. Friday. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think I came in. So, what do you think that surge at the right at the end there? I mean, People just wait until the last minute. Really it's the honest. last minute before the last minute, which is election day. Mm -hmm. They had a whole day ahead. So they, they had a whole week prior that they right. could have come in, but interesting. I think, right. I think I had just put it off myself. We had uh, we were Did required. Um, we we were eligible for two grants, one from the auditor's office uh, and one from I think it was the elections division, but. In any event, um, the one of the ones where we could be reimbursed for the hours that we were open on the Saturday um, required that we post our early voting hours in two newspapers, which um, we did do. And it turns out that we were eligible for $1,800 in reimbursement as a result of having the polling location open for four hours <coughs> and meeting all of the requirements. Um, How much did it cost for the ads? I know, it was $900. Oh, but, oh, uh, okay. not, I mean, yeah. yeah, but it was worth it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so if you look on the fir very first page, I have uh, a list of the dates and the times that we were open. Uh, interestingly enough, the state only reimburse us when we are have early voting during our regular business hours. So they did not reimburse us for it, for any early voting that we did after 
for the two days that we did it. Really? Yeah. Yeah. The other way around, maybe. Or the early hour and a half that we were open for two days as well. So I know it seems strange that to me. That doesn't make much sense. It is strange. It's very strange, but yeah, they did. Well, was there a big difference having the polls open at 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. instead of just consistently being no. 30 to 4 30? No. It was very slow. I mean, you know, we we probably had 15 voters come in between the two early days that we were open. It was not, it was not really. But you know, for those 15 <coughs> voters, it was probably you know very helpful for them that mm -hmm. we were mm -hmm. here and available. Um, and we ran with a, with a skeletal crew. It was just the office staff that ran uh, during that first early morning, okay. and then 8:30 to 4:30. So. Yeah. So if you look at, the, um, if you go down to the bottom, of, this is Michelle Tassinari's memo. She's the um, director and legal counsel for the Commonwealth. Um, at the very bottom, I have the cost of the election. So for early voting weekdays, it cost us $7,136 for personnel. And the weekend, uh, was 1800 um, and election day was 19,566 and then some other costs associating with ha associated with having the election and the total cost was 31,000 of which $8,900 is we're, we're going to be reimbursed for um, that we normally wouldn't have expected but it was due to early voting so the city portion turns out to be $22,713.50. And in the other pages that I have uh, included here, there's a couple of pages that talks about um, the mandates regarding early voting. So if some of the stuff that we did seems kind of not necessary, um, most of what we did was required by law in order for us to get reimbursement. Um, and so I thought it would be helpful to see some of the things, um, you know, that were required. Personnel check, they didn't expect us to have a full staff on for, um, as if we were an open polling location. So we didn't have a warden, we didn't have a clerk. Um, but we did have inspectors and we did have constables out in the hallways making sure that no one left with a ballot. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I, you know, you can read that at your leisure. Um, so, this Pam, you were covered in all the wards, though, right, during the election? What do you mean? You were covered with staffing. Correct? Yes. Yep. We had, we had, um, the outreach that we did to the counselors, thank you to all the counselors who sent out memos. We were getting calls up to the last minute and taking people Good. to um, work the polls, and it worked out very well. We weren't short-staffed any, at any polling location, um, and in fact, a couple of places, um, you know, there was some scheduling issues where we would call people. They wouldn't call us back, but they did show up on election day. <laughs> We had to send those folks home. So, um, did people attend these um, election worker trainings? So, the the um, I did include. There was a question about what did we do to help people get ready for the elections, as far as the new equipment is concerned. Um, if you look on the back side, we had two days of training. If you look on the back side, uh, it talks about the. Uh, new voting equipment training and we had training for the wardens and the deputy wardens to come in and be trained on the equipment for the wardens and the deputy wardens the training was required and we paid them to participate in a two-hour training session um, and for the clerks and the deputy clerks we provided um, the hand counting procedures for the primarily for the, that one election where we had so many write-in um, candidates during the primary. So 
the required uh, participants were the clerks and the deputy clerks, and, and everyone came. Um, if people couldn't come, I did a couple of one-on-one -on -one training sessions with people to get them up to speed, and um, I think it went very well. People appreciated the training. Um, we did have a couple issues with the machines, with the new machines, and I'm not totally convinced that it was um, the machine itself. There's some quirkiness about the new machines that I think we're sort of becoming accustomed to. Um, there's one button on the machine that if you press it five times in a row, it shuts the machine down. So 7A, 7B had an issue where their machine went down all of a sudden, um, and it, I think it may have been due to this button pressing issue. <laughs> um, but they don't seem to recall. Well, I don't know exactly what happened, so we're just talking that up to training. <laughs> So what do you do with something like that, Pam? Once it shuts down, restart again or reboot it? So the, there's an emergency bin on the on the um, ballot box. So when people come in and the machine is not functioning, they can put it inside the emergency bin. And when the machine gets back up and running, the warden can then run them through the, the optical scanner. Yeah. We also had an issue um, <coughs> past election at 6B where we had some, something on the scanning head of the voting equipment um, and it seemed to work its way out of the equipment as the election went on because we had problems for about an hour and then afterwards it seemed to everything seemed to flow just fine afterwards so I'm very pleased with the response from um, LHS, who's the company that provided the equipment. Um, on election day for the primary, they had somebody stationed here full time. On election day for the, um, the November election, we were a phone call away from somebody who, when we called, they picked up right away and answered our questions and we got instant instant help to keep us up and running for the entire day so yes. so you mentioned there was that hour uh, there was like an hour in one of the ward six, six machines yep. and that um so those votes were counted correct <laughs> I just want to be <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> give you the opportunity yes we <laughs> fixed it <laughs> yeah, we, well, we fixed it, but in the meantime, you know, we had people put their ballots in the emergency bin. I and see. And then once okay. it, you know, I mean, then we... So they weren't registering and they got kicked back out and then you put them in the bin and then, okay. Yeah, and then when it, when it sort of, you know, it sort of worked itself out with this one little kink, it was really crazy. So we it must be set up to remember, must, you know, to, to remember what had already been counted before it shut down. It didn't shut down. So what was happening was we feed the ballot through, and then the machine would say, um, uh, there was some message on there indicating that the that the the ballot could not be read. So it didn't count anything on that ballot. It just spit it back out. Got so it. you feed it through a couple more times, still can't be read. Then you put it in the emergency right. bin. Right. Some, <laughs> somebody else comes up, and to the very lucky day, the ballot goes through, and no issues. And then, so you try other ballots that weren't going through before, and then they will go through. So you know, just it seemed like there was like something on the the scanner head um, that was preventing. It probably was, you know, where the registration marks are on the ballot itself. Hmm. But yeah, we uh, yeah, it's, every ballot was counted. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and you can tell, you know, if you look at if you look at the number of blank votes, there aren't that many. Um, oh, this one doesn't show the number of blank votes, but we didn't have that many blank votes. Or okay, you have to hand ballots. count everything anyway, right? Because of the state senate, oh, was that? A, I can't remember. Was it? You right. Didn't. So what happens is that the machine will read every race that does have something associated with it. Right. It separates the ballot when you have 
when you've indicated a hand right in. You mean mechanically? It separates those balance from? Yeah. So, so there's two different compartments in the machine. It goes through the machine. It says, okay, somebody colored in the oval for okay. a write in. So yeah. it puts that in one bin. And wasn't and that the vast majority of the ballots that they absolutely. were? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> yes. and then those, those ones have to be hand counted, right? Yes. Yeah. So probably 98% of them were hand counted, you think? Or 90%? I don't think it was that high. Maybe. Because there were some people who voted for the candidate on the ballot. So. Oh, that's right. Yes. There was a candidate on there the ballot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's, right. that's right. So we're looking back. The, the, the procedure for, for dealing with write-ins was you, you had an adequate process for it, it sounds like. Everything went smoothly. We, yeah, and, and the state did, you know, they did, they came out and did training right. for us. We, I participated in Amherst. I think there were a couple of people who were running on that campaign who also participated in that training. And um, it was the, you know, uh, Michelle Tassinari, who, you know, she's the director and legal counsel for elections. She came out and trained us about how to uh, adequately count ballots with handwritten, um, handwritten uh, candidates. On Did it. you encounter any problems with those in terms of <coughs> a name that was illegible or anything like that? You know? No. Not really. Yeah. Well, that's good. So it uh, and and uh, no, we didn't we didn't have any issues at all. Even the ones that get separated, though, just just to be clear, the ones that get separated, that's that where the bat the ballot is completely read by the machine. Those get looked at. They don't get counted, but hand counted. They get counted by the machine. But we do look at the ballot to make sure that voter intent is understood. So if there was somebody who, for example, wrote in a name but didn't color in the oval, when we saw that, we yanked that ballot out and, and, and made the correction uh -huh. on our, on uh -huh. our sheets. That's so great. we did look at every single ballot, but that's just really, right. you know, a sorting process more so uh, than an actual counting process. And have you compared notes with other town town clerks in, in the Senate race in the Senate district since then? Has, did everybody have pretty similar experiences with the straightforward process for those? They did counting um, of the of the writing. And and if you think about it, we have fourteen precincts, and for the most part, all the precincts have the same number of registered voters. For those communities around us that don't have machines. They can count every ballot anyway. Right. And you know, they may have twenty five hundred people right. come out to, to vote, but they don't have a machine to count it, so right. they you know, so you know, when you put it in that perspective it doesn't seem quite as daunting a task right. to right. count twenty five hundred ballots. Well, we were yeah. still here till eleven o'clock. Uh, I was here till almost quarter to one. Um, but we were done counting by eleven thirty and you know, put in all our tallies because the process was, you know, there was so much hype that people were really nervous to make sure it got done correctly and, and uh, it was done, it was, you know, they did quite a professional job. Yeah. Well, nice going. Thank you. Because there, 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 there was a lot of hype and a lot of anxiety and a lot of, a lot of worry about how, how is this really going to work out at all? Just, Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah, I want to thank you and all your staff and all the people who worked on all the wards. They did a great job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, and I just want to add, I was really impressed with the way you guys handled the primary. Because that's where you had all of the write-ins and all of the tension. Where, and this is, this is a report on the election in November, not the, right. the primary. Well, there's a couple of pieces from the from you know like the training we did prior right. to the primary and that sort of thing. But yes, everything else uh, attached here is from the uh, November election. Yeah. If you have any questions or anything, you want to look at the full report. I mean, this is this ends up being like a 21-page report. Um, I just gave you the back section for the state election. Um, but all the races are in the full report that gets uh, sent off to the state. So.
And is the, 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 the vote on the questions by Ward and Precinct, is that now up on the website? It's on the website, yep. You, you'll find it under elections and then election results, yep. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Nice Thank to see you. See you. Thank you. Nice to see everybody. Bye. That was great. Yes, very helpful. All right. All right. Well, for the record, we'll off to her next meeting. And what we could do is at least uh, take care of the minutes of the November 5th meeting. Yeah, before she heads out the door. <laughs> Second. All right. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That was pretty easy. That was a good one. And really, um, the only things we have are the two remaining appointments. Uh, Dennis, you were going to speak with Alex Jarrett? Yes. I spoke with Alex Jarrett, who many of us know through his. Uh, Roll and pedal people, which has been quite a remarkable success. He's one of the principal owner workers and driving force all the way along. Um, and he's also a serious student of cooperative business structures. And he's also become quite a serious student of uh, various approaches to affordable housing. He's, he's come and spoken at um, <coughs> public comment. So, He's a, he's a very curious guy with a lot of creative ideas uh, about about housing, and fortunately for us, he said he wanted to step up and take those ideas to public partnership. And he's been attending meetings for a while, so he's all geared up and ready to go. So uh, it'll be a, an important addition, and so I'll move that we pass along a positive recommendation to council for Alex Jarrett. Second. Okay, moved and seconded to send Alex Jarrett with a positive recommendation for appointment to the housing partnership. Full council, all in favor? Aye. 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 I think that's unanimous. And finally, uh, Jeremy Whalen. Thank you. Um, so uh, last Friday evening, uh, uh, I had the pleasure of meeting with Mr. Whalen down at the Roost to. Uh, connect up with him about his, you know, his background and his interest in this uh, position on the Human Rights Commission. Um, you will, I think you you might remember uh, Jeremy spoke to us a few weeks about uh, ago about wanting to join the Human Rights Commission, but um, more famously uh, back in the spring I think it was where he was here to speak about teacher salaries and he had a very long list that oh. came across the floor here yeah. and circled the yeah. Northampton yeah. salaries about yeah. halfway down. <laughs> yeah. and, um, and, that, um, it, and I think that that kind of speaks to the, the type of advocate that he is, that um, he's, uh, that he's uh, 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 open to uh, being critical but also engaging people in conversation. And that I had that sense throughout the hour we spent together. Um, that uh, we talked on a, a number of topics. I'm not going to go through them all here, but that um, that that I, I think he's going to be a fine addition to the Human Rights Commission. Uh, a few things in his background: since high school, he's been uh, volunteering at a camp every summer called Camp Sunshine. It's for uh, children with life-threatening illnesses uh, so he's been doing that since high school um, this summer he <laughs> this is what he did over the summer uh, at one point he was he went to Puerto Rico to help deliver generators um, he also spent time in a school I think it was in Lebanon uh, for uh, Syrian refugees uh, working uh, so it, it, as a teacher um, currently, he serves as the technology teacher at NHS. Uh, one of the projects that he spoke of that was really fascinating had to do with, he's created a virtual reality interactive video with the NHS students. And with the goal of within the video embedded in it is, is the, where you learn to detect the, er, the warning signs of abuse. So you see a real, 
relationship in front of you, people interacting it, and, and you, you, you start to see the body language and, 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 and the dialogue that's going on, and you start to read, you know, like, hey, this might be worrisome. I, I thought that was fascinating. You know, and he has students involved in that. Um, so, I think I've gotten through all my notes. Anyway, so I, there was much more I didn't write down and take note of. And uh, but I, I think he's going to be a great addition, and uh, would like to send his name forward with a positive recommendation. I'll second that. Okay, moved and seconded to send Jeremy Whalen's appointment to the Human Rights Commission with a positive recommendation. The full council. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <clears throat> and that's your okay. Um, we will likely have some more appointments in our December meetings. Uh, I'm just anticipating for January 7th, which would be our next meeting. Um, council of large did mention, <coughs> just off the top of her head, maybe. Uh, asking Chief Casper to see us again, but I don't remember precisely when we, when we met with her last. Um, but, you know, those are departments we haven't met, and again, that has to go through the mayor's office, though. So, so mm -hmm. if you haven't met with police or fire or the building inspector, it used to be the main, when this was the public safety committee, right. we basically would meet with police and fire you know, at least half a dozen times a year. You met with Meredith and her. It's been since I've been here. So it's been, I've been here a year now, October 30th. So yeah. It's within yeah. the past, within that time frame, but I can't remember exactly when. Oh, you Bobby, mean, it was something you mean whether, marijuana. yeah, yeah, yeah. That might have been the last time was when right. they, they gave an update time. on the marijuana um, right. legislation. So, I mean, we could put a, a request in if we want to ask her to come and give us any update on, like you said, maybe any issues around the traffic. Yeah. <clears throat> traffic, uh, first night will have been the week prior and getting an update on that. And so that okay. could be good. I mean, yeah. There's a variety of issues with them. Could we reach out to um, Lynn? Yeah, 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 I guess sure. And then ask, so again, if she could come on January 7th four o'clock and then we'll take up whatever other appointments come to us in the meantime. Now is there specific issues related to traffic that we were going well, to I, I should Netta, ask her to be prepared. The, yeah, so um, um, currently it has to do with the, the Netta operation on uh, between Cons and Pleasant Street and how that's going and hopefully things have changed evolved a bit by January, and um, what was the other thing we were thinking? <clears throat> oh, maybe just an update on you know first night and how the stroll went and things like that. Okay. But also update. on on Netta, um, I know they've been called in to provide some additional security for transporting cash. Oh, that's a good one. Get there. Kind, of, <laughs> kind, of, kind of curious. Police, huh? Well, they, some kind of vendor. Netta's got their own security, but there's a there's a lot of money, a lot of cash. That all these big numbers you're seeing, it's all debit cards and cash. Right. They can use debit cards. They use debit cards, so it's not all cash. Yeah. Um, matter of fact, a big chunk of it is debit cards. Apparently. Well, but that's good. There's still a lot of cash that has to move. Where it moves to, I still have. So I guess you could say a general update into any issues related to the recent opening of Netta. Yeah. Okay. And first night. Right. And anticipating additional stores opening in the yep. months ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> Anything else? I'll ask for a motion then. Move to adjourn. Second. Okay, non debatable. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay then. Uh, Thank you.